so we don't have time to discuss here. But most of the experts in PPP, <coughs> they have said that only NVD model can be possible in railways. Other models, they say, uh, is impractical uh, to introduce any other model. But in case of FDI, if we go by NVD or, uh, model or fixed return model, I think you know the case of a A lot of wood plating uh, takes place. So, uh, so uh, I think uh, first, uh, unless we have a model uh, through uh, for private uh, Indian uh, investment, which which we have tried and tested and uh, uh, we, we can say we can say we can implement it. The state of if we go for NVT model, I think uh, this is going to be another and because of the good thing. No, I take your point because I think this is a very untested uh, area. So one is not quite sure about a how much money is going to come, how is it going to come, what are going to be the kind of arrangements which are going to be there with the railways, if at all. So I think this is just a matter of conjecture, but I fully agree with you. Really. I think uh, whatever you have shown here, 90,000 crore is the total value of the list what you have taken from the side. I was involved in the <coughs> making of this list. I think this list is a tentative list. We have given a disclaimer to this list that this project can be taken out of this list and new project can be added to this list, depending upon the due diligence which we do later on. So maybe even 10% of this may not come. Because it depends that whether the project is viable enough to service the FDI and viability gap funding 20% tab is there today. So within 20%, 90% of our project will not qualify. So this, uh, the list is only tentative and unless we are sure that we are able to service the NUT or we are able to service the FDI requirement, the project will not come. Like high speed rail, uh, there is a viability gap funding of 60%. Now unless 60% is given, of, uh, by the government to this uh, SPV, the return will not come. So, in the today's FDI uh, PPP policy, this high speed cannot come. Unless the 60, 20% becomes 60%, or it becomes even 90%. So, there are policy issues involved in the inflow of FDI in railway. Now, so far, operation is concerned, we have permitted operation also in the standalone systems. It is not that we are not permitting, we are permitting operation also, total management operation in the standalone system. Now we have a model that is our non-government model, like private railway model. They can do everything themselves. Uh, high speed train, they can operate. So operations is being provided, but not on the existing system, but on the new system. System. new system. And so far, NVT and uh, we have got three models already approved by the ministry and uh, via the website. There we have got different type of risk mitigation uh, procedure we have uh, given so that the investor is you know competent. Now we had an investor meet uh, recently in the board, and their whole worry was that our uh, approval system, our whole working system is so restrictive that people are afraid that our project will not get approved. So the main issue is the procedure, and main issue is the approval, main issue is the land acquisition, main issues are you know different type of clearances. So. And they said that why the domestic capital is not coming to railway? Forget about FDI. If the domestic capital is not coming, FDI will certainly not come because it is one step ahead of domestic capital. So the issue today for the ministry will be to sort out its internal you know, procedures and clearances and support systems for FDI to come. So this is our, uh, you know, the current reading and we, we have just started. So we'll see what will happen. Thanks. Just one quick question. Um, if you are going to give uh, projects on FDI, you have to cover the revenue risk of the investor uh, by an assured rate of return, which inherently means that the project is has got a high rate of return on investment. So I think the big challenge for the railways is that if it's got a high rate of investment, then why give it to an outside party? You would like to put in your own money and get it there. Why, why would you later want to share your uh, the your revenues with the investor? So I think this is a big challenge, and how this is to be balanced, perhaps if you have some idea. No, see, essentially it's a case of saying that we have a certain lacunae which exists in the system. I'm not able to provide the funds because we don't have the funds within the country. So the whole idea of having foreign direct investment is 
where I don't have the money and in case I'm able to get in the dollars from outside. So I'll get in that particular investment based on whatever norms we lay down. So I think that's the way we should look upon FDI in any particular segment. Because in case I had the money, the thing would have flown in. And I think all the time we were relying on the government to provide support in terms of infrastructure funding. Now we've reached a stage where the government is not able to do it. And the government does not want to do it, which also I think makes a lot of uh, sense. In that case, I leave it open to the private sector. Now if the private sector is not able to to, to come up to this particular challenge, and I keep it open for the foreign investors. Not to say that they agree, not to say that money is going to come in here. Because I think the problems which an Indian investor has will be probably multiple times which, uh, I mean, the foreign investor will have multiple times the concerns than an Indian investor. I want to know your views particularly for foreign funding in terms of the freight corridors, like the Western is funded by Japan, the Eastern is, a part of it is funded by World Bank. How does that help with regard to foreign direct investment? That's one question. So sorry, can you repeat the question? The question is your views on the funding, like, Japan is funding a, a major portion of the Western Corridor. World Bank is funding a, a section of the Eastern Corridor. That also adds, in, if I understand correctly, in terms of the foreign direct investment, the companies will be coming in to, to set up their plants, facilities in India, so on and so forth. And the same for high speed, which you've already mentioned, China and Japan are sure interest. So one is to, uh, to your views on the, in, uh, on the in, because these investments from World Bank and from JICA and Japan, Japan's case are at very nominal interest rates, roughly as good as 1 or 0 percent. So how does that add? That's one. And two is, in the list that you had given uh, about the various items, mass rapid train systems are also there. Uh, companies have already started setting up Bombardier, Alstom, Siemens, they already have their manufacturing plants. And they, yes, uh, that, that's my account, second part is just my account. And they, they, they do cater to the current metro systems which are there, to Delhi, to, to Chennai, to Mumbai, and they're also exporting. So the how, that's how they, um, they, they figure out the, the return policy, because they do the export from India itself. In that okay, for your first question, we need to distinguish between when World Bank gets involved and when you're talking of investment, because when a World Bank gets involved, it's not in the form of equity, so it'll be in the form of a loan, where there is no ownership. The ownership remains with me if I'm the if I'm the person who's doing it. World Bank is giving me a loan and I do it. So if you look at most of the urban infrastructure, for example, it's being financed by the World Bank or the ADB, which normally do this thing for them. It's not really being done in terms of, of, of uh, equity investment. Now, most of the FDI investment which comes into India are coming from US, large part from coming from from uh, Europe. When you're talking of Europe, you're talking of countries like Germany, UK. They're the ones, uh, your Scandinavian countries. And the large part is also coming from uh, countries like Japan, and to a certain extent from uh, China. But of course, the way in which they route it, they normally route it through the Mauritius route because of certain kind of tax benefits which come because the, of the ease which is there and the bilateral agreements which we have with uh, countries like Mauritius. But these would be the main uh, sources of uh, uh, information. Now, as far as this uh, rapid uh, transport which you are talking of, yes. To the extent that we are having currently, in whichever cities we have it, they are being uh, uh, financed or they are being put up, uh, the material is coming from uh, uh, foreign investors. But when you are talking ahead of creating these systems on a larger scale, all encompassing in these particular cities, we need larger quantities of money. So that's what we're talking of. We're opening it up fully, hoping that somebody would come here and create the entire system for specific cities. In, in relation to the first one, uh, what about the concept of tied loan in this case? That won't that add FDI? No, anything of loan will not come under FDI. As FDI is... As a, as a, just, just, I'm sorry, sorry. Just short, yeah. uh, uh, in terms of a tied loan, like Japan has, had, has a tied loan in terms of the Western corridor. So, the, the material necessarily has to come from Japan, and a part of it can be manufactured in India also, as long as the Japanese company has some say. I don't, I'm, I don't have the numbers with me. No, that's okay. So, but so that also helps in setting up facilities in India. No, it will help in setting. It's indirect. Set it's an indirect setup. Yeah, it, it is definitely a help, but that will be more of a bilateral issue. It's a case of the Japanese government and the Indian government working together for a certain thing, which comes, from, which is beyond the purview of FDI. So if you're talking of this FDI and railways, will it include this particular thing coming from Japan? No, says no. Uh, my question to you is, uh, you know, overall, uh, when we talk about investment in India, be it be railways or infrastructure, uh, we have, you know, crowding of investment 
basically you talked about debt market where uh, uh, in fact most of the debt market goes into either uh, government security or it goes into corporate uh, uh, mostly PSU bonds. So there is no debt market available in India. So anybody who has to make investment, whether equity uh, kind of investment which you're talking about, FDI, he has to access at least 70 uh, percent of his capital from the debt. And uh, not only the debt is not available, but it's a very high cost debt. Now, it has a strong bearing on the equity which you're talking about. Because if you have a very high cost of debt, you have uh, all the IRR of the equity gets highly skewed. And similarly, you talked about foreign rate uh, exchange. Now, it's also very important that we uh, you know, manage our exchange very well to have FDI. Because if the exchange rate keeps on going up 5%, 6% every year, that's the kind of additional loading on the return. If these two things are not taken care of, uh, whether it's railways or whichever sector we are talking about, uh, I don't think a uh, lot of FDI is going to come. No, I would uh, fully agree with you on the second issue in terms of the exchange rate, because when any investor is looking at uh, opportunities in any of the emerging markets, you actually want to ensure that the exchange rate is stable and not volatile because when you're taking a decision, you're taking a decision which goes over a period of 10 years. So you actually take a 10 year view of what the exchange rate would be like and nobody would really enter in case you find that the, that the exchange rate is um, it's, it's not stable. So I think this is the onus really on the Reserve Bank of India. That's the reason why the RBI is very conscious of this particular fact and ensures that it uh, that the volatility in the exchange market is controlled to a very large extent through their own direct intervention or through their operations through banks. Now, as far as the first part is concerned, when you're talking of uh, the corporate debt market, see, the problem in the corporate debt market is that it virtually doesn't really exist because we don't have a secondary market. Uh, borrowers in India typically prefer to borrow from banks because you already have a long-standing relation with them, and it's much easier to get it rather than go through the regulatory hurdles before you go into the for raising any kind of a bond in the market. So I think that's one reason why the bond market hasn't evolved. So we cannot really rely on the bond market to provide these kind of long-term funds. And that's the reason why everybody is talking of uh, FDI coming in or opening the doors for FDI. And FDI also has the advantage that in case of debt, I'm borrowing money and then I'm uh, investing. So what happens is that I need to get my return, otherwise I become an NPA if I'm an, if a domestic investor. Whereas in case it's a foreign investor, we are assuming that he's borrowing at a lower rate taking into account his exchange costs and then looking at his returns, he would probably be placed in a better position than an Indian investor. 